So I'm an astronomer as well as an artist. Uh, and I want to talk about that, that interplay between science and art. I, the, the best example I can, I've ever been able to find is this one right here. You take a look at two drawings ma made of the moon. We're all really familiar with the one on the right. That was Galileo's drawing that he made looking through his telescope in uh, November of 1609. But that was not the first observation of the moon. Rather, it was made by Thomas Harriot in England back in July of 1609. But look at those two drawings. The Renaissance hadn't reached England at this point. The idea of the interplay of light and shadow and how to capture it in art, uh, representing three-dimensional objects in a two-dimensional drawing hadn't really gotten to England, certainly hadn't gotten to Thomas Harriet. So when you look at the drawing on the left, it's not clear he had any idea what he was actually seeing when he looked at the moon. You look at the one on the right and you can feel the bumps of the mountains and the craters. The one on the right changed people's views about our universe, and that was through the power of art. A little bit more recently, uh, in 1871, uh, the first government-funded scientific expedition out to the Wyoming Territory to see these strange geological features of the Yellowstone region took along two artists. One was a photographer with this brand new technology, but the other was a painter, Thomas Moran. When Moran got back, he painted this, the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone. This stunned communities back east and was one of the inspirations, one of the driving forces behind creating Yellowstone National Park just one year later. <laughs> Go forward to the 1930s, the midst of the Great Depression, you had the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, encouraging people to see America, in particular, in national parks. And I love this one, using Old Faithful. You go to Yellowstone today, and in fact, any national park today that had one of these WPA posters, and they are everywhere. They are on sale in the gift shops. They are a part of that park's identity. So I started working with national parks, not uh, uh, actually on, on astronomy issues, night skies. It's one of the big things to come along in the last 20 years is this idea of parks as places to see the night sky. I, at one point, had envisioned myself, oh, I'll be a photographer, I'll capture the Milky Way, I'll be famous, I'll sell lots of photographs. I never sold a one. <laughs> but I drew a poster about this same act, seeing the Milky Way in the National Park, and the idea that half the park is after dark. This I've sold thousands of. So the power of posters is something that really drives people. It doesn't have to be an actual photographic representation, but something that evokes the emotion of seeing the stars in a national park. This works even more so when it comes to total solar eclipses. These are not purely scientific phenomena. They're not even purely astronomical phenomena. These are also emotional phenomena, which we'll hear about with our, our next speakers. So this is where art comes in. In 2017, we had a total solar eclipse going over some major national parks and it had been 38 years since the last one. So not very many people knew, how are we going to sell this to the public? Will the public be interested? Using that WPA uh, tradition, which Grand Teton had its own version of a WPA poster, I worked into, let's try to educate people about what they will actually see if they come to these places. And so we talked about the, uh, the corona, two minutes over two minutes of totality, first one in a quarter century. He's worked phenomenally well for the national parks, but it also worked for small communities looking to have uh, events, solar eclipse events. Uh, Carbondale is at the crossing point between 2017 and 2024. So they made sure that when uh, I designed this poster for them, I gave them all the fonts, all the rights, everything, so that they could change this to, to be as just as applicable next year as it was back then. All right. So there's, there's the, the power of this kind of outreach is for the annular eclipse, showing people where can they go in a visually appealing uh, keepsake thing. So for those of you handling events who want to actually raise some money, help offs offset some of your costs, these work out to be great uh, merchandise items. People want to take home the concert poster for the thing they just saw. Uh, and that goes with, of course, you've got places that are not only in the path of the annular, but in the upcoming total eclipse as well. So out in Texas Hill Country along the, the Frio River. 
Um, yeah, that's one of the big things about this eclipse that we're coming up to with the, uh, the total eclipse. Unlike the 2017 eclipse that went through some giant national parks and some very tiny towns, this time we've got a huge range. Big cities, San Antonio, small towns like Holton, Maine. <laughs> <laughs> we've got a huge range of parks from tiny little national parks all the way up to really world famous state parks. And speaking of the national parks, there's a whole bunch of them that that total eclipse is gonna go through, but most of them are not on the, the really big bucket list for people. So it's a chance to really discover some beautiful places about this part of the country. And again, using this style of art, style of uh, merchandising, style of outreach and commemoration, uh, this becomes something that, that can really drive interest in these events beyond just, ooh, there's going to be an eclipse, but the emotion and the history of the place. Um, and this is doubly so for where I live uh, in the Finger Lakes of New York. Uh, this is a poster based off of an old steamship timetable from the 1800s that used to travel the lakes where I am. Much of the big tourist center cities uh, in the Finger Lakes, central New York are just outside the path of totality. So communicating to those people they need to drive north and to the folks that come to say Ithaca where I live or Watkins Glen that's famous for its racetrack, that hey, you can stay there, you can eat there, but you sure as hell need to drive north of there uh, in order to see totality. That's a big, big part of this. So what I encourage folks to do is Dive into your local artistic tradition, find local artists, find emotional ways to create that concert poster, that movie poster that will drive people to your program, your eclipse, your destination. So just want to say thank you. I also wrote a book. Um, <laughs> so my publisher wants me to say that. Um, so and I guess with that, I will pass it on.